As a child, I knew I wanted to be an architect. But I didn't just play with Legos and build matchbox cities. I was the kid who bought plan books with my lawn mowing money, and I'd redesign the floor plans. To my eight-year-old self, this was being an architect, drawing and cutting paper, building models. There were miniature versions of big things. I could hold them in my hands. I was making. Then I went to architecture school and realized there was so much more. History, theory, materials, engineering, and construction details. And I devoured all of it. There was so much to learn, to take in, and I loved it. School inspired and fed my interests. But the reality of practice only diminished them. As an intern, I sat at a CAD workstation for 12-hour stretches, drafting the most mundane elements of buildings. All the things that led me to architecture, they were missing in practice. When I passed my licensing exams, I convinced myself professional life would be different. For a time, it was. As I went to work for a small residential firm, there were interesting clients and projects, beautiful locations, and larger budgets to work with. And importantly, I was making. I was working on house plans as if I were eight again, playing architect. But soon, these partners were forced by a recession to focus on making ends meet. And when I was making, the credit for award-winning work went only to the namesakes on the door. I was commuting 72 miles each day. I felt like a cog in someone else's vision of an architecture practice. This wasn't my childhood vision of architecture, of a creative life. I'd always been trained that there was one way to practice architecture. A client equals a project. And so you find clients and serve them. Finish this job, search for another client. Time worked is fee earned. But when I started out on my own, I had this realization that time is a fixed asset, the ultimate constraint. Which means that whatever we do that's linked to time is limited in the same way. When I was young, I didn't think about this as much, but as I got older, I started to feel this press of time. And so I experimented with as many things as I could to subvert this relationship. I wrote, I designed on spec, I developed products, and I accepted every project that came my way. With each new experiment, I was finding this awakened and rekindled creative drive. I cataloged the results, what worked, what didn't, and the catalog became a sort of handbook, a field guide. At first, it was just for me. But the more I learned, the more I wanted to share it. And there were others, in fact, many others, experiencing the same dissatisfaction that I had experienced in my early career. They too had followed all the rules and were highly trained for a profession where the luxury and the rewards of creativity were only available to an elite few. And the rest, just trading time for dollars. This field guide I was writing was for them. And it became my first product. I packaged it up as a book and sold it online and then in print. I followed it up with a second volume describing my attempts, some successful, some not to reinvent the traditional practice of architecture. Each new product became a small revenue stream. And with each new stream, I earned a little more freedom. Soon, I didn't have to accept every commission. I could be more selective. I had the freedom to pursue interests like filmmaking and video editing and to use these new skills to create more products. I developed short courses and taught on my YouTube channel. The videos began to earn ad revenue. Above all, making became a part of my life again. When I decided to build the studio, it was simply a place for me to make and manage that was separate from domestic life. But like any creative work, in the design process, it became much more. It became the avatar for the life I was designing, the one I was trying to figure out. I needed it to validate the choices I made, to prove that I could support my family doing something creative, doing what I loved, making, so I set out to construct a simple monument to my design philosophies and aesthetics. I envisioned the project as I had everything else, a series of experiments in new construction techniques, the use of humble materials, a place to test new details. It had to be small, so an experiment in changeable and multi-use space. More than just a work of architecture, I wanted it to serve as an educational tool, 
for clients to understand and experience my work, but also for students and viewers online. It became a workshop for sharing the process behind the making. Drawing inspiration from simple farm buildings, its form is an archetypal barn, which historically served many functions and created a large sheltering space with little money. In a barn, everything has a purpose, and its means of construction, the way it's put together, the hand of the maker is present, plain to see. The materials were chosen for durability, but also to show how humble, inexpensive resources can feel tailored and precious. The large glazed areas are for sketching on with chalkboard pens. The wood storage area facing our home is a seasonal revolving calendar of sorts, filling up in the winter and emptying towards spring. There's a quote by the author Annie Dillard that stuck with me. She says, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. Every day, I walk 17 paces to my studio and I make things. In the morning, it's writing, video scripting, recording, drawing, sketching, there's no email, no texts, no client meetings. That's followed by an hour or two away from the studio where I get outside. Usually a hike or a bike ride helps me to recalibrate. This ritual is as much a part of my creative process as drawing or model making. This time away from the studio helps incubate thoughts. There's a point where the ideas coalesce, where the right wires find each other and there's this clarity. I never know when it will happen or even how this works, but it does and I rely on it. I use this time as a transition to managing. My afternoon is then given over to email, texts, all the urgent demands of the business that can't be ignored. Placing the making ahead of the managing was intentional. When people ask me about the practicality, the rigor of this, like it's impossible to ignore email. But the funny thing is, once I started this routine, it didn't take very long for the people I work with to accept and respect the idea that this is a calculated part of my creative process. Each day, I return here. Each week, a new experiment in making. It's made me feel more alive and more purposeful. What keeps me interested is the idea that I don't have it all figured out. The studio is like a creative cage I keep myself in after a 17 pace commute each morning. My schedule for making is designed to keep me focused on the work that makes me most happy. The studio is a container for an ever-evolving creative life one where I can decide what I work on each week. Not the one thing I was told I should be doing, but the many I choose to do.